Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Wednesday, April 4th, marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Through incredible footage from the time and new interviews with friends and colleagues, the documentary King in the Wilderness tells the story of Dr. King in his last months as one of the great, if not greatest, civil rights leaders America has ever had. Let's take a look at a clip. Civil rights, King, roll 20, sound 36. Martin Luther King Jr. was a human being and he was imperfect. He was conflicted, but his love was unchallengeable. We have an opportunity to inject morality in the veins of our civilization. We were trying to redeem the soul of America from racism, war, and poverty. We're dealing with issues that will call for the restructuring of American society. The most difficult time of his life was the 18 months before his assassination. I will continue to preach nonviolence. I do not know that everything that Martin said or did, he was quite prepared for. In the middle of all that was the rising of the Vietnam War. Dr. King made the decision that he had to be against the war. These people are damning me when I say you ought to be nonviolent toward little brown children in Vietnam. Stick with civil rights! He said, my friends are turning on me. He was devastated. Do you fear for your life? It isn't so important how long you live. The important thing is how well you live. Attacks and the criticisms on him were getting more and more vicious. <laughs> I'm gonna march if the spirits in march. The FBI was constantly investigating King. We will not tolerate lawlessness. I'm gonna march if the spirits in march. Dr. King looked me straight in the eye and said, if you can't drive, you run. If the spirits in march. You can't run, you walk. I will march alone. Can't walk, you crawl. I'm gonna march if the spirits in march. If the spirits in march. If the spirits but keep moving forward. Everybody, please welcome Peter Cunhart, Jernona Clayton, Taylor Branch, and Trey Ellis. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Peter, I want to I wanna start with you. Uh, you directed this film um, when you first got on board and decided to make a documentary about Martin Luther King. What, where were you coming from? What was your initial take on a take on it because the story of Dr. King has been told in, in many varieties in many different ways. So what story did you specifically want to tell? When I tell people we're doing a film on Martin Luther King, everyone kind of rolls their eyes because they think there have been so many of them. They think they've seen it all. And it, what it really comes down to is they've seen the I have a dream speech drilled into their heads so many times they don't want to see it again. So we didn't want to sh show that early period of King. We wanted to show King the man the, and, 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 as, as a true human being and the struggles he went through. And fortunately, Taylor Branch, who, who has done the great scholarly work on King, encouraged us to focus on the last three years, which is when all his uh, greatest trials and tribulations happened and he was really put to the test. And so this film starts in 65 and ends with his assassination. So did you meet with Taylor and sort of uh, talk about what would be the best point to, where would be the best point to start? Or was it just sort of a natural evolution that way? We did, we did start. We, we, the, the, two, the first two people beyond our, our, our production staff to come aboard were Trey and Taylor because uh, it, we, we couldn't have done it without Taylor. T T Taylor had spent, how many years did, did you take writing your, your books, Taylor? Uh, 24 for the three, three books. That's when I met Zernona. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 24 years of scholarship went into this. And, and uh, so it, at one of our very first production meetings, uh, we wanted somebody to uh, steer us and somebody to take, take that direction and go down and interview 19 people who were still alive who were King's inner circle. And Trey ended up being the person who, with Taylor, did all the interviews. Um, Taylor, what is it about those last three years that, and, and, and Trey, you can, you can both answer this question, whoever jumps in first really gets it, uh, that, was, that, was, that you felt was most compelling about, about King's life? 
Well, I would say what's most striking about it is that early in Dr. King's career, he was kind of reluctant. He was a reluctant leader. He didn't join the sit-ins until the very end. He didn't go on the freedom rides. He was a great spokesperson, but was reluctant. But toward the end, he was more driven. Uh, he, he, he dragged people to Selma. His staff didn't want to go. He dragged them to the north to show that race was not just a southern problem. He dragged them into Vietnam saying if we uh, protest, saying, and then into poverty, and, and finally to Memphis. And so he was really more possessed to leave a witness, if, 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 if that's the right, uh, a right way of looking at it. So I think the downward king that was determined to go, he, he said, the, va the mountaintop is great, but the valley calls me, from the Nobel Prize to Selma. He's in jail within a month, uh, and then goes to the north. Um, and, and that's what you see here, more of a prophet. Um, of an amazing ambition. You, you heard even in the trailer them saying at the, at the beginning that they didn't just want to get segregation off their necks. They wanted to redeem the soul of America from racism, poverty, and war, which he would say violence of the flesh and violence of the spirit. That's unbelievably ambitious if you think that this was a movement that didn't have any of the traditional tools, a minority movement that didn't have any traditional tools of politics. So I think that ambition and that, that principle is what you see most clearly in, in, in this film when he's dealing with all the problems that still plague us. It's one of the things that I love about the time period that this film focuses on is the time period where King really becomes a huge uh, advocate and believer in workers' rights and the economic rights of, of those in America, not just African Americans. And it's really in Memphis where you see all of that come together, which is where he's unfortunately uh, assassinated. Trey, what do you think that it says about Martin Luther King? Because I think we have seen the I Have a Dream speech. But we actually haven't seen, as Peter said, this period of time in his life depicted that often. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we don't focus as a country that often on his focus on economic rights and worker rights and poverty? Right. I think that's a great question. I think there are a couple things. The main thing is that at the moment, he, the moment before he died, he was never less popular. The moment after he died, everybody wanted a piece of him. So the people from the right and the left taking his 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 uh, the, who he was as an as an image as opposed to who he was really with his real message. So I think when people say, "Oh, if, if what would King do if, had he lived?" I think if you look at at I Have a Dream speech and we stop there, we think we don't know what he would do. But in fact, our film starts when all those successes have ended. So we see what he would do. He would do all the progressive work that we're doing right now. That we talk about uh, militarism, uh, poverty, racism. All these issues that are still with us today, he was fighting them even though the, the world wasn't ready to fight them yet. So that's what's so exciting about this film, I think. It shows the side of him that people haven't seen before. It's as if he still were alive because he's saying things that are so germane to what's happening today. It almost feels like in a lot of ways that period of time is, is willfully forgotten so as that the culture doesn't have to focus on where the next progressive steps for the movement were going to be. Uh, Zernona, first off... Your jacket is amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, second off, when, when, when you were asked to be interviewed about this, what were your first thoughts about the fact that it was going to focus on these last years of Dr. King's life? And well, what was your, been, if you don't mind, what was your association with him so we can give the audience some okay, context? I was a friend. Uh, I was an employee. I was brought to uh, Atlanta from my home in Los Angeles. Um, my first husband was uh, asked to come down to help with public relations and speech writing and that kind of thing. So that's how we got invited. Uh, and I had traveled uh, with Mrs. King on her nationwide concert tours before we moved to Atlanta. So having come to Atlanta, um, I saw the man who was bigger than what I'd seen him to be. I knew him as a Baptist minister, a man who had a mission. Uh, but I learned so much about him that he was... Uh, a man first, and this is what I remember now the most, is that the man practiced what he preached. He had a lot of preachments, but he practiced all of them. Um, I remember, and I was just talking to somebody about how when he and Stokely Carmichael uh, broke their relationship, um, Stokely said to him, I've got to leave you, Doc. He said, because white people have never been right. They're not right now. They'll never be right, so I'm leaving. And Dr. King said, well, I'm sorry to see you go, 
but I'd like to talk to you about just what you said. We cannot eliminate white people. We've got to love everybody, and unless we join hands together, we'll never win this fight and the war against racism and poverty. He believed it very strongly, and he was criticized also for that, but it didn't matter to him. He had love in his heart for everybody, and he practiced it. Now, I tell people today, I remember a man who practiced what he preached, and that's not always the case uh, with human relationships. You know, people promise you anything, deliver nothing. Uh, but when I came to Atlanta, I saw him in his bigger scope. Um, he was a man who just believed that with his leadership and the fellowship he had with him, that he could redeem the soul of America. He wanted so much to do that. Did you ever find, as a, a being his friend, that he was at all a hesitant leader at times or that he had doubts about his leadership? No, he never doubted his leadership. He doubted America. Uh, he felt like America wasn't right all the time to uh, follow through on its promise. And uh, that bothered him the most. And, you know, he really liked uh, President Johnson. Initially, they had a very good relationship. And he thought with that good relationship, you know, he would help um, get to that promised land, as he calls it. Um, but he knew his fellowship was safe for a moment. Now, where, when that changed is when he came here uh, to Riverside Church and uh, made his speech on, on uh, Vietnam. He said he was at home watching television. He at first decided not to say anything. But he said he was getting ready to leave, had the television on, and saw these children being mistreated in Vietnam. He said, now I've got to say something. And that's when he came here and made that speech. But everything in his world changed after that, everything. His friends left him. And the part that bothered him the most, and he just seemed to lament it all the time, I saw the anguish in his face. He'd come to me sometimes and talk, just, just to talk about it. He said, I can understand when your enemies don't follow you and don't believe in you and don't support you, but I can't believe that the friends have deserted me. And that pained him. I have often said now that he died of a broken heart, that he never got over the fact that everybody turned against him with his position on war. He said he thought everybody understood that there is no victory in war. He preached it all the time, preached sermons on it in church and practiced it as, oh, every time he went someplace to talk about issues. Um, but somehow they didn't believe him. And so he didn't believe that his friends now were surprised. Uh, Peter, the film uh, isn't afraid of covering a somewhat dark chapter, I think, in, in, in Dr. King's life, which is his, um, his relationships while on the road, his, uh, the, the way that the FBI was trailing him, and also intentionally trying to haunt him, I think, trying to create a more paranoid environment for him. Did you have any hesitation in, in, that, in that section of the film and how, how far you would, want, you would want to go and how much you would want to show? Because it is, um, he is such an amazing uh, figure in our history, I think sometimes people would have hesitation in, or fear of tarnishing him in any way whatsoever. We didn't want, we, we wanted to cover everything but not slant it so that if you go down an avenue like uh, that, it can, it can take on a life of its own. So we wanted to address his, his the difficulty, difficulty, difficulties in his life and also um, his own failings and his weaknesses. Uh, what we felt, what we felt strongest coming at us was his his darkness and his depression and and his workaholism and the fact that he was like a on a trajectory that he couldn't get off of and he knew it was going to lead him to his death, but uh, he couldn't stop. So to 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 portray this man during this period was to see somebody who was very human, but also superhuman in his strength to continue doing what he was doing despite all this going against him. What is it like, uh, this may be tangential, excuse me, but uh, when you're watching the section of the film about J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and the really 
deplorable tactics that, that, that they were using against Dr. King just because they were fearful of the, the possible change that he could bring in and was changing, you get a really sour taste about the, the FBI and its relationship to progressive movements. What, uh, what do you think about that in regards to how we view the FBI right now and what's happening with the FBI and the fact that they've become some sort of weird hope for, prog for progressive movements in this country? Yeah, it's the whole uh, the FBI section is really interesting, and we were trying to find some of the the informants that they used, really to a devastating effect for the for the civil rights movement and especially the Black Panthers and the Black Power movement. But they also used informants really effectively and decimated the Klan. So they were they they uh, it's their, the FBI's legacy. I think is is complicated, and I think that uh, we're just getting to the beginning of it right now. Yeah, the F the FBI early in the movement was considered the better alternative if you were in the, in the South uh, as an alternative to the sheriff or the local police department. And a lot of people thought the FBI was a point of refuge and an only, uh, in, in the movement. And yet, in the upper political echelons of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the film exposes it. I mean, whatever issues there are about Dr. King are greater issues about the performance of the FBI because I've seen hundreds of memos in which they say you cannot cause embarrassment to the Bureau, meaning it's got to be done skulkily. It can't be done openly. We will expose King as an immoral opportunist who is using the race issue for his own personal gain, which is about as cynical and, and far-fetched as you can have, and, and about as far from any legal um, mission that the FBI should be engaged in. So anything about Dr. King's personal life raises greater issues about the mission of the FBI. I mean, it's hard for people to remember that the FBI didn't have any black agents then and no female agents, uh, none. And they only had- A representation of the status quo. And the, you know, so much of it was, yes, obviously about their own, their own racist spheres, but it is about the preservation of some form of status quo that they exactly. believe in. Exactly. It was a very hierarchical organization. Hoover, Hoover could fire people at, at a whim. Uh, and He's keeping dirt on presidents, too, to try to keep them in, in his pocket, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. I think it wasn't just the status quo for the FBI, but it really it was Hoover's private army at some point, his yeah. private intelligence force. So he really he had his own, his own issues that he could prosecute. And I think, I mean, Clarence Jones, you'll hear, he said some fantastic stories where he'd forget something, and then to fact check, he would actually request the, from FOIA the transcript from the FBI because he knew that they were taping his conversations. So he went back, and that's how he could remember what he was saying, because he knew that they were taping everything he did. You're not a, oh, sorry, Peter, I was going to say, Clarence also told us that he was at the FBI recently when Comey was there, and Comey kept under a piece of glass on his desk the letter uh, authorizing surveillance on King. And he says, every new agent that comes through here, I show them this letter and say, this is, this is not the way we do business anymore. And, you know, the um, FBI was relentless and trying to get the message to Dr. King. And <clears throat> they sent a, a tape to Mrs. King um, describing some you know, sexual uh, encounter Dr. King was supposedly uh, had been involved in. They sent um, tapes to our offices uh, trying to tell them that he wasn't right, he was totally immoral, and trying to get Dr. King, because you know, he just would not respond uh, to uh, the FBI and the FBI, especially Hoover, would send people on the staff uh, tapes, try to get him to convince them. And one reporter came to us from Associated Press who said, um, we are pressured in trying to get the message to Dr. King that we know what he's doing. Zernona, uh, so I think it's Tuesday. Wednesday is going to be the 50th anniversary of, of the assassination of Dr. King. What do you, what do you want fifty years later people to really take from from this documentary and from Dr. King's message? The one thing that just speaks to my heart all the time is that even if you didn't know Dr. King, and people who weren't born, of course, don't know him, but even if you didn't know anything about him, here we are as a nation and a world celebrating fifty years after his death. The one question you'd have to ask, boy, what kind of man was he? He must have lived a life that had some impact. 
Because sometimes I was talking to a man just recently, and he said, I've been to so many funerals. I said, oh, who died? He said, oh, let me see. Um, the other day I went to, you can't even remember. People think now when you're dead and buried, you're gone and forgotten. We are remembering this man 50 years after his death, not his life, his death. So we now know, and I say with pride, he must have had a marvelous life, and he did. Let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Right here. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, uh, how did it feel um, taking this documentary to Sundance? Uh, what was the audience's reaction like after they watched it? Sundance. <laughs> I'd never been to Sundance before. Um, Peter and Trey and I were there with Andy Young, um, and we had four screenings. Uh, they were all full. Um, it was everything I'd hoped it would be, except that it was really cold. Um, um, but the audiences were really good, and the, the most common reaction that, that I got in talking to people afterwards was, this is a different Martin Luther King than, than I knew. You know, all we grew up on is Rosa Parks sat down and King had a dream, and that's about as much as we had time for. And this is a, this is a, 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 a driven, thoughtful, philosophical man dealing with issues that are about the future, really. He's basically saying your patriotism and your faith, your belief in equal citizenship has energy that can solve these problems for the future. And um, so I thought Sundance was, it was fun for us, but it was encouraging that I think people got the message of the film, that this is not about uh, an age-old problems of where people sat on the bus, but this is somebody dealing with problems that face this country still, and that it's a model. Yeah, I work in feature a lot, where you're actually used to seeing, being in a big movie theater, and you can gauge people's reactions. Where for television, like for HBO, you don't really have that luxury so much. So the screenings at, at, at uh, Sundance were super gratifying. We have, we have a, some premieres, a screening tonight, and it's going to be in some uh, theaters here and in, Calif in California. Um, to be in a room with people, to, there's something really wonderful and communal about this message, and to watch it with people is really super gratifying. Next question. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I was wondering, even after working on a documentary, um, what would you say that uh, what Dr. King would say now after uh, all the stuff that we're going through um, at this moment? <laughs> that's tough. I'd say he'd get to work. I think that's what I think that's what I think is most to me was most gratifying about it, when I went around the country interviewing these heroes of mine like Zernona. Uh, they um, it's easy to think they were just perfect people and they were had perfect energy. Uh, so c because I'm not perfect, I can just watch and I don't I, I get lets me off the hook. I think you watch this documentary and you feel on the hook. You feel like you have to to activate. And of course, with what's happening now with Dr. King's granddaughter, just you know, just yesterday, right? Just um, speaking, or two days ago, um, Yolanda, uh, that we and, and the BLM movement and the Women's March, this idea of marching and, and radical change through nonviolent protest is never been more important than it is today. Zerona, so, do you want to answer that question at all? Um, I just think that. Um, I'm just, you know, my personal experience is just uh, different because I saw him, live with him under all circumstances, saw him feel the pain uh, of his work, saw him smile, the pleasure of his work, um, and I still uh, don't like that he's remembered for I have a dream. Yeah. Uh, I kind of resent it so in a sense that I think of a dreamer as someone who's asleep, and Dr. King was anything but asleep. Um, and he was just bigger than life. Uh, I've never known anybody who had so much love in his heart, so much um, energy to devote to changing the pattern of America. A man who loved people who he knew didn't love him been in his presence, he's been spat on. I've been in his presence when they knocked him down. And he gets up when he talks about um, being nonviolent. And I remember the first time I was with him when we were on an airplane and 
he was sitting down and a man, well-dressed white man, walked up to him and said, are you Martha Luther King? We knew then when they called him that, they weren't up for good. Uh, Martha Luther King, he said, well, I'm Martin Luther King, Jr. They called, they called him, Mar what did they call him? Martha, Martha oh, Mar Luton. Oh, I see. Martha I see. Luton. Wow. Yeah. And um, it's a strange then, insult. Sorry. <laughs> then spat all on his face. And I doubled up, you know, getting ready to suck him. <laughs> and Dr. King says, Zernona, you've got to be nonviolent. He said, because you're too little to whip anybody. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but if I kick him in the right place, <laughs> I can get some attention. Um, but every time I've seen an ugly act, saw another man knock him down in my presence, and he gets up and dusts himself off, says nothing except, this proves we've got more work to do. Calmly, peacefully, lovingly. I've never known anybody who was as strong in their commitment to fight the evils as he was. I think we have time for one more. Hi, right, guys. Here. I'm looking forward to seeing the film. Um, what I'll say is, what was one of the hardest things for you guys to put out here in the film? And what would you like young people to take away from watching this film? Well, the hardest thing for me is when the team came to my office and tore it up uh, with all their equipment to do the shooting. No, seriously. Uh, I haven't seen the film. I wanted to wait. Uh, so tonight will be the first time I've seen it. Um, but I always welcome an opportunity to talk about Dr. King um, so I could tell the stories that people don't read in newspapers and magazines and books, um, the real man. Um, and I'm going to take a moment. I know we rushed, but I've got to tell this story. Can I tell about Absolutely. The, the driving? I knew him from afar before I moved here. I mean, moved to Atlanta. But I always saw him in the presence of grandeur, like he was staying in a lavish suite in a hotel. He was driven around, squared around in a limo, security teams all around, you know, living the life of a rock star. So I knew him as big. So when I came to Atlanta, I was expecting some of that, you know, to be his lifestyle. So the first day I was to meet him, uh, my husband and I came to Atlanta, and he said in advance we were going to go to dinner after church. He was preaching that morning. And he said, um, so soon as the service is over, you all just wait for me, and I'll come down, and we'll go to dinner. Well, there was a car parked in front of the church, um, a small car like a Nash Rambler. I don't know cars very well, but it was small. And... Um, I just assumed there's someone parked, and they was in church. And here comes Dr. King. He got in the driver's side, which surprised me because somehow I never thought he could drive. You know, he was always being squared around. He got in the driver's side. It was a nice, sunshiny day. As soon as he put the key in the ignition, the windshield wipers were going back and forth. And I thought that was odd, but I figured he hit the wrong button on the car. And then we backed up and went in reverse for almost a block. And I finally just couldn't be a nice visitor, and I said, Dr. King, why are we going in reverse? And why are the windshield wipers going? He said, oh, this car has to go about a block before it warms up. <laughs> and, and we backed up in reverse for a block, and then he stopped, and then we would move forward. I said, oh, wait till I tell the nation how big you are at home, you know. <laughs> um, so that was a lot, so many funny stories. I think one thing that I was pleased coming out of the, of the film, and, it, and you wouldn't see that unless you were thinking about it, but it's, it's worth telling you. The film's very unusual in the sense that it has no narrator and it has nobody summing it up for you. One of our big problems with Dr. King is that people want to sum him up as I have a dream and so forth. Peter made a decision to have only witnesses like Zernona, I mean, Trey and I are there, but you never see us. We're asking the questions. The only people you see are eyewitnesses, and the film leaves it up to the viewer what you take from Dr. King, what his struggles were like, how they apply today. Um, and I, 
the only one that I wish we could have gotten in a little bit more is how important young people were to that mission. To remind people that King himself was only 39 years old when he was killed, and that the civil rights movement depended on the witnesses of college students and even eight-year-olds in Birmingham marching into dogs and fire hoses. So um, th that's a message I would like to get but uh, to come out of the film. But uh, the, the fact that Peter chose to swing out there with just eyewitnesses and nobody to tell you what to think is, is, a, is a sign of faith in the viewers. That, that that I hope will will pay off. You know, Taylor and Trey interviewed 19 people. We have about 35 hours of really good storytelling. You heard a little bit from Zernona right now. And I should say that HBO has made the gracious and great decision to allow us to put those uncut interviews online after the film comes out. So there'll be an archive that anyone can turn to and and hear what was left out of the film. Oh, well then, so they will get to hear Trey and me then. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to go do that. <laughs> Finally, redeemed. <laughs> um, I, I love the film, congratulations. It, uh, like we said, it really focuses on, a, I think, an incredibly important time in, and message of, uh, of Dr. King's that rarely gets looked at. Um, when can people see King in the Wilderness? Yes. I think it premieres on HBO on the 2nd. The 2nd, 8 right. o'clock. Excellent. Everybody give, uh, give the team behind King in the Wilderness a round of applause. <laughs>